that most of the commentariat condemned and was surprised by the appointment of his friend John McDonnell as Shadow Chancellor. But if you get into the mind of Corbyn, it was obvious that he had to do it. MacDonald had in a way made Corbyn. It would be like Blair not appointing Brown as a shadow chancellor, or Cameron not appointing Osborne. It would have been an act of gross disloyalty to his close friend, at a point of maximum power. He had just been elected by a landslide, and the first thing he was going to do was expose his weakness and betray his close friend. He was never going to do it. And although he was put under pressure not to do it, he chose loyalty to his friend. But in choosing loyalty to his friend, he generated the problems that we have now seen and fueled the discontent. Similarly, Corbyn and indeed McDonnell have always been in politics, certainly in the House of Commons, to be loyal to their principles. They have never entered the House of Commons in agony about what to do because of what the media would do, because of what the opposition would do, because of its electoral impact. If they were against something, they would vote against it. Always loyal to their ideas. And suddenly, as I mentioned at the beginning, once he has unexpectedly seized the crown, he starts to be disloyal to his ideas. He finds himself in the agonizing position of having to pretend an enthusiasm for the European Union that he doesn't have. He now accepts, he would love to say, that we should pull out of NATO, he can't say. It. Suddenly, his lifelong loyalty to conviction is being challenged as he finds he has to be loyal to party unity. And this test of loyalty I think is going to agonise him. One of many things which is going to agonise him as he grasps with the challenge of leadership. And meanwhile, the rebels, who of course the media elevate as great titans because they are opposed to Corbyn and therefore assume the rebels are the good ones, must also agonise about to whom they are loyal. They cannot say they're being loyal to the party. The party was just elected by a landslide, the leader they seek to depose. And if they have been loyal to ideas, they need to start thinking very deeply what those ideas are. Because we can't carry on with that vacuum for much longer. You can't be loyal to relevance. I mean, <laughs> um, and so they too are being challenged at a very basic level about where loyalty lies. And if they depose Corbyn, to whom are they then being loyal? I think they would say the country, because they would then have a Labour Party they would claim that is electable. But they cannot, there's this middle bit about being loyal to the party, and they can't as yet say that. They would be being disloyal. So whirling around the Corbyn leadership are fascinating Shakespearean themes around loyalty. How is it going to end? No one knows. As I say, both sides are currently trapped in this dynamic um, of uncertain outcome. But it's made me reflect on two things. The recent past. At some point, I think, there will be some revision of the current total disdain of that new Labour era. Suddenly, to so some people I think, given the current chaos, you know, Labour doesn't stand for Trident but doesn't stand against it. Labour back the Osborne deficit strategy, now it doesn't and all the rest of it. Suddenly, I think, some of the new Labour uh, lessons must be relearned about message discipline, frankly. Sounds terribly unfashionable and dull but is necessary, about, in the end, unity, about, in the end, defining where your loyalty lies, um, the absolute clarity of message, the discipline. I think these things became deeply unfashionable as we all reacted to that Shakespearean tragic end of that era. But we are reminded now, as with the early 80s, about the downside of too much looseness, division, 
contempt, mutual contempt, and so on. The other thing I was reflecting on is it's very hard to see how anyone surfaces from this um, as a sort of gladiatorial leader in the sort of Thatcher way who took on her party or the Blair way who took on his party because Labour will be in some ideological <coughs> turmoil for some time to come. So I will leave with this really unfashionable thought. I was reading the obituaries of Den Seeley, who was a huge figure in the Labour Party in the 60s, 70s, and then during the traumatic early 80s, when he was on one side of a civil war. And it seems to me that the Labour Party is what Harold Wilson used to call euphemistically a broad church. For those of you who don't know Wilson, he was Prime Minister in the 60s and early 70s. Deeply unfashionable, it's almost as if he never existed. But it seems to me there will also be a rehabilitation, partially, of Wilson. Because Wilson managed to keep that show on the road. The party then was as split as it is now, with incidentally much more titanic figures on both sides. We were talking earlier, one of the ironies of the rise of Corbyn as a rock star is there's never been anyone less like a rock star in the history of British <laughs> politics. But in the late 70s and early 80s, there was a rock star on the left, Tony Benn, who was one of the most mesmerizing orators I've ever seen. And on the other side, there were the giants like Dennis Healy, who's been written about recently, Roy Jenkins, David Owen, Shirley Williams, and Tony Benn also had the almost as charismatic Michael Foote and others on that side. And the skills of keeping a party together, winning elections <coughs> under that context, have become hugely degraded uh, with the romance of the sort of Thatcher dominant leadership, which in a very different way Tony Blair emulated. There are many, many virtues of that style of leadership. It is just not possible now for Labour. And therefore, whoever surfaces from this cathartic explosion will, I think, need some Wilsonian genius to keep the whole thing going. It will not be the case of one side being totally defeated and the other side winning. It's too nightmarish in balance for that to be a possibility over the next five years. Now I'll just have one final thought. While it looks as if the Labour Party is uniquely fragile and the Tories remarkably strong, Cameron and Osborne are intelligent enough, I think, to recognise their own current fragility. A majority of 12 with some of the thorniest issues any Prime Minister could face, including a referendum on Europe, which is becoming increasingly complex for him in terms of timing, tone, and a renegotiation with the European Union much bigger than when Harry Wilson held a referendum on the same topic in 1975. So, although the commentariat focused justifiably on this extraordinary story that we'll probably be mainly focusing on in our conversation together. I think British politics as a whole, Scotland as well, is going through a uniquely feverish, shapeless period. Not uniquely, but one in which I think the mainstream parties are all in different ways quite vulnerable. And therefore the 2020 general election is just too far away for anyone to make confident predictions about what will happen there. But in the meantime, the rise of Corbyn remains one of the most astonishing stories of our lifetimes. Thank you so much. <laughs>